It's a nocturnal novel. It's Mexican Gothic fiction. It's awesome. <laughs> Buenos dias, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent, back from the dead, back to the grind, back to the books. No time to waste. Hope you're all doing very well. Great to see you. We're counting our lucky stars over here. The hurricane really didn't cause too much damage. A few fallen branches and some, you know, power was out for a few days, but I mean, it was fine, you know? Uh, could have been much, much, much worse. So we're very thankful. And uh, thanks to everybody for uh, supporting the show through the the, the chaotic period that has been September 2017. We're getting into October, we're getting into fall, so here is a long overdue, legendary novel that was called One of the Greatest by none other than Jorge Luis Borges and deeply inspired Gabriel Garcia Marquez. One of the greatest ghost stories, if not the greatest that I've ever read, Pedro Paramo by Juan Rulfo. Oh, I gotta get the coffee going. Just roasted this coffee from Brazil among the lizards outside yesterday, and I'm going to start selling this and giving it to patrons. So more on that later in the video. Just want to give you a taste of what this, uh, how this book starts out, how this ghost story starts. I came to Comala because I had been told that my father, a man named Pedro Paramo, lived there. It was my mother who told me, and I had promised her that after she died, I would go see him. I squeezed her hands as a sign I would do it. She was near death, and I would have promised her anything. Don't fail to go see him, she had insisted. Some call him one thing, some another. I'm sure he will want to know you. At the time, all I could do was tell her I would do what she asked. And from promising so often, I kept repeating the promise even after I had pulled my hands free of her death grip. Spooky. Juan Rulfo is the only author I've come across who perfectly constructs sentences that convey silence, right? Uh, <laughs> way easier said than done. How he does this, I'm, I'm still trying to learn. I'm still trying to determine because um, it fascinates me, you know? It's brevity for one, like it's economy of words, but it's also, uh, it's the things he chooses to describe and the voices he chooses to incorporate and the, the, the narrative shifts, uh, of which there are plenty. Although the, the tone stays the same, mostly. It's got this ominous, dark, foreboding, grim, gloomy, whatever you'd like to describe it as. It's so, sort of like this veil that hangs over everything, this funereal, uh, funereal doom. <laughs> like, like nobody has a, um, nobody in the town has a happy ending. Nobody. Uh, there are no happy endings in Pedro Paramo, but, but that doesn't mean that they're not interesting or, or that necessarily they're all, uh, um, uh, depressing. Uh, it's just sort of got this, this, this weight to it, this ominous weight, this dreamlike, um, cloud of mortality. Maybe that makes sense. Maybe it doesn't. It's like as if you were in a dark, low-lit theater, like in the Black Lodge in Twin Peaks or something, right? Watching an old black and white Mexican ghost story with very slow pacing like Brasson or, or like Bella Tarr, you know, who did the turn horse in it. These really slow black and white films, very serious, very atmospheric. Pedro Paramo eases along. It's never boring. Or if it is, then it's pleasantly so. It's not... Um, obnoxious. It's, uh, it's built with obvious craft, craftsmanship. And I mean craftsmanship in the laborious, purest sense of the word. Like the guy who keeps cutting and burning his hands over and over and over again, but he doesn't, he doesn't care because he's too distracted because he's searching for something. He's searching for the form and the material. He's too busy searching for the perfect sentence to convey the perfect silence, the, or the authentic silence, the true silence. For years, Juan Rulfo did this. He, he would, it was a, a process of elimination, as he described it, right? Uh, like the wonderful Susan Sontag mentions in the foreword, Rulfo has said that he carried Pedro Paramo inside him for many years before he knew how to write it. He was writing hundreds of pages, then discarding them. He once called the novel an exercise in elimination, right? So, 
kind of an arduous way to write a write a novel, but but certainly in this case, very very effective. You know, it's it's the distilled uh, essence. So Borges was a fan, Marquez was a fan, everybody's everybody loves Pedro Paramo. Which was Rulfo's one and only novel, his only one. Juan Rulfo was a fascinating guy. He was a tire salesman, a traveling tire salesman before he was a famous author. He was also an excellent photographer. You can see some of his stuff on Google. He's certainly a, one of those figures who proves you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be young or you, and you don't have to do the, the typical trajectory, you know, you, you can live a life that is entire, you know, and support yourself in a, in a manner that is entirely divorced from the creative process, you know, and you can still, still create a masterpiece, you know, in your 40s or 50s or whatever. There's no one, there's no one way to go about this, you know, just like, you know, it's typical, sure, or it's more common for you to, you know, for the, the famous authors, like, oh, they write one in their 20s or, or some of them in their teens, you know. We're gonna go the Rim the Rimbo route, uh, and just you know, oh, they're a prodigy, and oh, they do this, that, and the other, and oh, they 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 get successful very, very young, and then they they you know, they just create masterpiece after masterpiece after masterpiece, and all the way up until their death, and they're a writer forever. They're a famous writer forever. Not so with figures like Juan Rulfo, which is very curious. Uh, one novel, and that's it. But. Highly respected, highly revered, and I mean, single-handedly moving the medium forward with a with a 120-page book. <laughs> it's, a, it's a somber, melancholy dream, right? The ghost story is really a collection of ghost stories from different ghosts. Uh, the narrator travels story to story, you know, ghost to ghost throughout the the town, throughout the you know. Um, the ghost town that is Komala and what forms is this spider web of all these different townspeople, these characters, where in the center, you know, they're all revolving around Pedro Paramo, this evil patriarch uh, who, who runs the biggest ranch nearby, which is uh, kind of like the lifeblood of the town, you know, and he is the father of our narrator, uh, main character, uh, Juan Preciado. Like Sontag points out, Paramo means uh, wasteland or barren plain, right? And as Pedro Paramo is a man who owns a ranch that the town lives off of, and then is angered by the town and stops working the land so that they all starve and die, spoiler, sort of, it's a totally appropriate title. But in the beginning, or the end, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to say. It's sort of difficult to measure time in this book uh, in general. But in the beginning of the book, Juan Preciado's mother dies on the first page, right? Like I read. And he travels back to the town where she's from, this small Mexican town filled with adobe buildings called Comala, to seek out his father, who abandoned him and his mother, Pedro Paramo. Right from when he's traveling down the road towards the town, you get a bad feeling. As a man he finds and travels with along the road, who is riding this donkey, you know, going in the same direction, eventually tells him that one, uh, Pedro Paramo is also his father, uh, <laughs> so you have the, the start of this, uh, this revelation for our narrator that uh, the first clue into the fact that Pedro Paramo has like, you know, a shitload of illegitimate kids, like basically like half of this town. And two, uh, Pedro Paramo has been dead for a long, long time, and when they reach the town, uh, he realizes that everybody there has been dead for a long, long time. And the guy he's, he's walking to the town with, the fellow on the donkey, has also been dead for a long, long, long time. He's a ghost. He's the first ghost he meets. Uh, Abundio. Everyone is dead. The entire town is full of ghosts. And it's through the ghosts that Juan learns about the evil, tragic figure that was his father. And, you know, his history and his family's history and where he came from. It's a nocturnal novel. It's Mexican Gothic fiction. It's awesome, right? It's about love and death and families and disintegrated relationships, the downfall of a town and the end of its history, you know? It's about the past, it's about confronting the past and, and never getting over it and the endless story of our lives, you know? Over and over again, you know, confronting where and who we come from. 
and ourselves in the process, learning often very painfully what it means to be human, you know, and what it means to love others and to lose them. I think that's the, the most terrifying thing about Pedro Paramo is just the, uh, just how many people lose the ones that they love and, and just you, you really feel the whole tragedy of, of that experience, which all of us are going to go through at one point or another or be a part of in some, in some capacity, whether it's us uh, who are lost and others suffer because of it or, or whether we lose the ones that we love. And, and there's something so, so, so fundamentally human about that that Pedro Paramo gets perfectly right and it's mixed up there with with the horror of a ghost story just you know the horror of death in general but really it's about the tragic the tragic nature of losing people that you love and you know how all wonderful things will eventually come to an end uh but in in Juan Rulfo's end there is no beautiful beginning it's all it's a it's a it's a town of of night of darkness it never you know life is fundamentally and absolutely brutally tragic in this story and maybe that's true maybe you agree with that maybe not regardless uh you know it's 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 certainly not a lie um it is it is a shade of existence that we all have to face uh it's a beautiful sad song that everybody sings you know um It's not the only song, but it's a famous one. <laughs> uh, and this is a beautiful version. You have all these tragic tales from this town. And, and, and it never gets so heavy-handed that it, it goes to the point of, of comedy. I can't be cynical or, or um, dismissive of, of any of the, the tragedy in this one. Although, you know sort of speaking out about it after the fact, you know, there's so many of them and some of them are so sad that it's just like, when you're just like, thinking, like, God damn, you know, it's just like, I mean, but that, I think that's really normal people, you know, I think normal people, you know, uh, everybody's got some horrifically sad shit in their past, you know, everybody. And no, and no other novel captures that really, the quiet misery, or not, not even misery, because it's like, the characters are so strong that they're not even really sulking. They're just trying to cope. Just like the quiet struggle, I think. The quiet struggle of, of people, of just normal people in a normal town. Just like losing, losing everything that they've worked for and everything that they love, you know? You have a priest who, who refuses to absolve uh, the dead son of Pedro Paramo uh, because he killed his brother. He, he killed the priest's brother and then he raped his niece. And, you know, but then he does because, pay, because Paramo pays him money and, and the poor people can't pay him money and the priest can't live off of prayers, as he puts in the, in the novel. And so he takes the money from Paramo, and, who's the only rich guy around because he has the ranch again, and he's completely conflicted. You know, he's like, you know, how do you even begin to cope with that? Like, you need to eat, obviously, like, you, you can't starve to death, but you have to take money uh, from the guy whose son raped your niece and killed your brother. I mean, like, it's just, it's desperation, poverty, and darkness run abound. You know, it's just like, man, oh, it's, it's just brutal. And, uh, and it's not done in a melodramatic fashion. Again, this is all very, very economical writing, very, very tightly, 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 tightly woven and, and sculpted and constructed. And even Pedro himself turns out to be human, you know? Uh, even, even the monster that he is has the side that is, that is fundamentally human. The love of his life dies as well, leading to his and the town's downfall. Even the fellow in the beginning, Abundio, the, the ghost, remember I was talking about, even he, in, by the end of the book, has this, you, you find out his horrible tragedy, which is very... Just, that, I think that actually might have been just like the saddest for me. Not that it was the most tragic, but just the way that was communicated. You know, his wife dies. And he gets drunk afterwards, and then he commits a murder by by accident, uh, it seems. So it's it, and he, just the way he was describing his wife, perfectly alive the day prior, and then and then uh, and then dead the next, uh, you know. And then he's what can he do? He's so poor in, in this village. He, all he can do is just get shit faced, and uh, man, you know, that is just such a. Uh, it, it's just brutal. <laughs> 
It's just so, so brutal. It's a rough one, but it's so good. So Juan, one of our narrators, uh, discovers all the tragedies of these ghosts through these whispers and these murmurs and these appearances, these sightings in this town. Out of the shadows, these men and women appear in, you know, in veils or, or whatever. And in rooms, in, in empty rooms, he hears, you know, the screams of, of executed men and all these, all these stories and arguments and, and strange happenings. And in the middle of the book, he dies. Juan, our narrator, dies. Which somehow, while reading, I didn't get. <laughs> I didn't seem to figure that out, as the manner in which it's told is atmospheric, and it, it kind of, it, it, the book kind of drifts from voice to voice, right? Uh, from story to story, coming together and then disappearing again. Uh, it does very well, seamlessly. And after rereading, you know, after reading a couple of summaries to sort of like make sure I got most of the plot, uh, after rereading, uh, that's, that's my favorite part of the book, actually. And that was my favorite part initially while reading it. I just didn't realize that was when he actually died, uh, which he did. That's almost exactly halfway in the book. Uh, it's not an easy book to follow along. Like I said, I had to read a couple summaries just to make sure I had the full story. I even read it aloud, you know, to save you time and for your enjoyment, hopefully. More on that later. And still I didn't put together all the pieces. I read the whole thing aloud. Still didn't, still didn't put together all the, all the narrative. In the meantime to help, I found this little character chart, which is awesome, because you know, it has like the narrator here and then Pedro Paramo, and then you know, it's like, you, you can see how all the people in the town, all the ghosts are connected, how they're related. Personally, I'm happy I didn't get all of it because, you know, that means I, I need to read it again. And it's a pleasure to spend time in there. Uh, although not, not the happiest place, but, but it's not depressing, you know. I, I shouldn't, I, should, I need to state that. It's not a depressing novel. It's more atmospheric. It's more dreamlike. It's more kind of a, a I'm still, I'm obviously, I'm still searching Searching for the words, kind of a tough one to describe. It's sort of like slipping into a dream, you know, obviously like, it's such a generic phrase, a dream like, and like, I mean, like what the hell does magical realism even mean? You know, like it isn't essential for you to understand all of the narrative points, all the plot points to get something great, something profound out of the book. There's plenty to be had, you know, and I'm sure you're probably gonna wanna reread it anyways. Simple on the surface, but rich and complex when you enter this world, when you walk, into this tomb. Like when your eyes adjust to shapes in the darkness, as if the moon was revealed from behind some clouds and you see the road in front of you and you, you can see where you're going and where you're heading. And you can even see the city lights in the distance, right? But, 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 but as soon as you, you, you think you know where you're going, as soon as you think you've got it and you, you know the way, then here comes another cloud and whew, everything vanishes, right? It's kind of, kind of like that. The first time I read Pedro Paramo was when I was uh, 21 or 22 and I had just got off the Roberto Bolaño kick and um, I was getting into magical realism. You know, I had started hearing about Borges and, and Marquez and, and uh, Mario Vargas Llosa and, and uh, all Cortazar and all this stuff. Um, and Marquez was heavily influenced by Juan Rulfo. And a couple of people had uh, told me about it. They said, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and I was in the wrong headspace. I was absolutely, uh, I was way too um, impatient and eager for, for something. Uh, why, I should have been reading Batai at that time. I, I had, I, but, I, but instead I picked up Pedro Paramo and uh, I didn't get it at all. Um, I didn't get a single bit of it, none. I was totally bored. It was way too slow at that time for me. Um, just I was too immature or whatever, or just wrong headspace. I didn't know what to do with a book like this. But I kept hearing about it. I kept hearing that uh, it was a masterpiece from so many people. And so I figured, you know, I, I, need, to, I need to revisit it because clearly I think, you know, after, <laughs> after you hear it so many times, you're like, yeah, I definitely, miss, I definitely missed something. And I did. Uh, and so I'm thrilled to say on second reading, I finally got through, right? It finally hit me. Uh, I found my way in. And it's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful story and, and far more complex than I ever initially thought. Uh, and, uh, and a very tragic one, a very sad story as well. 
it's a ghost story, but it's, it's you know, you could use the term exi ex existential or whatever, but it's, a, it's an existential tragedy in the form of a ghost story. It's sparse and meditative and occasionally chilling. It's essential. Better than food. Perfect start for fall. Perfect. Pedro Paramo by Juan Rulfo. Check it out. I also read it out loud. I created an audiobook for patrons who are donating a dollar or more on Patreon. You can check it out by following the link in the description box below, if you'd be so kind. Hopefully you enjoy it and it saves you some time. It's certainly not a substitute for reading the book, which I highly recommend. I would say absolutely do that before you listen to the audiobook. But in case you know you don't want to like commit all the way and you want to sort of get a feeling for the tone and, and, and what it, you know, what it is, then uh, then check it out. Might be of use. I'm also drinking this delicious coffee from Brazil, which I roasted yesterday, and I've gotten to the point now where instead of just sharing it with close friends and family, I'd like to start sharing it with you, with all of you coffee and book lovers out there. So I'd like to send some coffee to the fine folks who have supported the show through this tumultuous period. Not only that, but I'd like to start sending more books to patrons as a way of saying thanks. So here's the big idea. I'm testing out this lottery type thing. I've written the names of all of the patrons who have donated $5 or more per video on Patreon, and I have placed them in the coffee drum roaster. Don't worry, I wash it. But, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to, you know, actually lottery, lottery things, sometimes I think old school ones look, kind of look like this, you know? But uh, I've written all of uh, the names of the, the Patreon uh, patrons who have donated five dollars or more per video and I am going to select one every review and I'm going to send them not only a book but also an eight ounce bag of delicious coffee from Brazil or, or Costa Rica or wherever. So we're gonna try this out. Mm -hmm. Need some theme music in the background. Gotta really get into it, right? Now you see all these things are sharp in here, so I'm gonna cut myself open. I'm gonna bleed all over the names. It's gonna be nice. I got. It has been done. So, <laughs> this is where I need my, my glasses, my reading glasses that I don't actually need. So the first winner, the first ever Better Than Food lottery, the fellow who shall be receiving Pedro Paramo and an eight ounce bag of delicious Sergeant Coffee is Simon L. So I will be getting in touch with Simon L on Patreon. Should Simon decline for whatever reason, and he should not if he knows what's best for him, no, uh, I'll just draw again, and I will uh, send, uh, send it to somebody who uh, will appreciate it. So. so right now I plan to send out a hard copy of the book and an eight ounce bag of coffee with every, every book I review. I don't know if it's going to be like that in the future, but we're gonna test this out, we're gonna see how it goes. If you donate $20 or more per video on Patreon, I will automatically send you a 12 ounce bag of coffee uh, with pleasure and a hearty thank you. Uh, if you would just like to support the show by buying some coffee, like a one-time thing, then you can purchase a 12 ounce bag of it for $20 plus shipping and handling. I do not have the online store up yet, so it's sort of like, you know, it's kind of secret just for now. You can like hit me up and uh, we'll work it out. Uh, I would sincerely appreciate it though. And this coffee has been delicious. Hopefully I will get that online presence up and running soon, but for now it's just sort of between friends and patrons on the show. Again, for those who have donated any amount at all to the show, I have made an audiobook of Pedro Paramo. You can go on to Patreon and you can listen on there. For those of you who would love to read it but just don't have any time, which I completely understand. And I plan to do this increasingly, either in part or in whole. Let me know if you enjoyed it, and thank you very much to all of those who have helped keep this project going, especially through this last month. It was just insane. But I have no complaints. I'm the luckiest guy I know. So, cheers. Always remember life is far too short to read bullshit. It was wonderful to see you. Henry Miller is on the way. I just had to take a break because it was... But <laughs> If you're looking for a critique or feedback on your novel, you can hit me up at booksorebetterthanfood at gmail.com. I charge $50 an hour and I will read your stuff and I will give you an honest opinion. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, any of those. If you hit me up on Facebook and give me a like, if you enjoyed this video, I'd sincerely appreciate it. Really helps out the show. Uh, much more to come. Lots of great books, especially as we're heading into October here. You know, it's my, <laughs> y'all know me. I like the dark shit. That's just, that's just my jam. And I got some weird stuff for you. I got stuff from all over the place, all over the world, man. That's gonna be great. So, have a wonderful day. Please subscribe if you have not already. Talk to you soon. Take care.
Have a good one. Ciao. Cramp. Cramp? Oh, God. Oh. Yeah. It's sitting too long.